Previously on the Carbide Cruiser series, despite some mistakes and setbacks, machining of three longboard decks was completed. Now, Winston speaking in third person must unravel a four setup puzzle in order to liberate kicktails from two kilogram bricks of aluminum. Though technically my kicktail model could fit with any piece of stock thinner than one inch, we need one of the faces of the kicktail to be perpendicular to our spindle so that we can machine a flat reference surface. Therefore, setup 1 needs the kicktail to be right side up and ready for the bulk of material removal. The first order of business here is to trim away as much extraneous stock as possible so that we can come back and use efficient adaptive toolpaths to rough out the kicktail. The fastest way to get through this material is with contour toolpaths, but because of the thickness of the material, following a single contour all the way down would result in a lot of wall contact. So instead, I enabled a roughing pass so that each step down would make two circuits around the workpiece. This cuts a wider channel with ample room for chip evacuation and makes it so that the end mill is only ever touching one wall at any given time. It'll take twice as long, but it's a necessary compromise and it's still faster than an adaptive toolpath. As extra insurance, I would have the 278Z single flute end mill loaded up. That single, massive flute has never jammed on me in days of machining compared to my three flute cutters which have gotten clogged on several occasions. After trimming off the excess stock, I could then apply a relatively efficient adaptive clear around the kicktail. This is really just an exercise in patience as we have a lot of material to get through, but not a lot of complexity. On the Mark 1 Carbide Cruiser, I then went straight into some contour and pocketing toolpaths to clean up my profiles and faces, in addition to parallel finishing the angled portion of the kicktail. However, fast forward a couple weeks when I had fellow hobby machinist Chris Lee in the shop, he pulled a move that sent me back to the drawing board. See, as a skateboarding noob, I made the incorrect assumption that a kicktail would only need to support the torque of levering the nose off the ground. However, that doesn't take into account the full system of the board and the rider. If the nose is popped off the ground while you're on the board, then at least half your weight will be on the back, potentially more depending on the dynamics of the system. Even if the probability of someone doing a manual on a longboard is really low, I didn't like the idea of an avoidable stress concentration on my board. So, for the Mark II boards, I built up a little more material around that corner and added a radius. This would require a few extra toolpaths to finish up like a ball end mill with a parallel finishing pass. Setup 2 would be to machine the bottom. The first priority here is to face flat part of my interface tab. Once that area is cleaned up and I can clamp that area for extra support, I'll be able to machine away the material over the angled tail. This is really just a pair of adaptive toolpaths, one with a quarter inch tool, the 278Z, and one with an eighth inch end mill using rest machining to nibble away what's left. You'll notice here that I have a taper angle on this extruded pocket. That's there to ensure that the pocket doesn't have an overhang that I wouldn't be able to reach from this orientation. A ball end mill would then be used to clean up the contoured surfaces. Setup 3 involves machining the grip tape inlay for the tail. Assuming I can align and pick up the part, I can cut a shallow straight walled pocket perpendicular to the face of the tail. I can also optionally face this area flat since it was previously only coarsely surfaced in setup 1. Setup 4 is to address a modification I made to the Mark 1 kicktail. I realized that tail dragging would be an issue if the kicktail was ever used as intended. Aluminum, even anodized, would suffer substantial damage against asphalt. So I created a pocket in which I could embed a Delrin wear pad. I modeled this pocket in a separate copy of my kicktail just to make my life easier and not affect any of the toolpathing for setup 2, which was a carryover from my Mark 1 project file. The wear pad pocket was machined with an eighth inch end mill using an adaptive toolpath. I shaved off about a minute from this toolpath by using rust machining and having a dummy toolpath before this that let Fusion know that my part had already been brought to near final shape. That dummy toolpath had a patch added to its model definition so that it stayed outside the pocket. I know that this is a lot of cam to take in at once, so let me illustrate these toolpaths with some machining. To validate my toolpaths and ideas for different setups though, I first machined a single kicktail as a proof of concept. This was back when I was using the Mark 1 design. I taped down an 8x6x1 by by inch block of aluminum to my Shapeoko's wasteboard and got to work reducing it down to the overall profile of the kicktail. My origin was set in such a way that part of my contour operation, including the lead-in for each step down, would happen predominantly outside the stock. This would save me from having to do any vertical plunges into aluminum. Next, I removed the extra stock and began the long, tedious process of roughing away a whole lot of aluminum. Despite the large volume of aluminum I had to get through, I really wasn't too concerned about it. Since I was working my way from the outside in, chip evacuation was a non-issue. And then, after a couple hours, all I had to do was clean up the resulting surfaces. 
For setup 2, I used indexing pins to locate my part and double-sided tape to hold it down. I had to elevate the piece on some MDF to keep the tail off the wasteboard. After facing off the top layer, I could then add a clamp for extra security and focus on the other half of the tail. It was at this phase of machining that I realized that part deflection and vibration could be a big deal. If I'd had a rubber doorstop or something compliant to jam under the tail, I could have fixed this, but my powers of improvisation weren't nearly as strong or effective as I'd hoped. But I still got through the toolpaths and was ready for setup 3. I machined a pocket that would perfectly receive the kicktail's angled profile, then using some double-sided tape I affixed my workpiece. Now I will admit that this isn't the most secure setup, but I'm not taking off a lot of material here. On the first few tries, as I crept up on the surface of my part a few thou at a time, I noticed that my tail wasn't sitting perfectly flat. So I took a clamp and put some pressure over the high spots to compress the tape there a little more. Eventually, I got the angle tail's face cleaned up with a flat end mill with a shallow pocket for the grip tape. So, rewinding back to setup 1 a few weeks after this, I loaded up a fresh chunk of 6061 and went through a similar operation as before. Except this time, there were a few more toolpaths present to blend in the half-lap interface into the tail. After having put in the time to demonstrate that the Shapeoko could repeatedly make this part, I decided to pre-rough my stock on the Brother Speedio at Carbide3D. Yes, this is technically cheating, but after sitting through about 60 hours of aluminum machining on the Shapeoko, I think I've earned it. A few minutes here saves about an hour and a half of work on the Shapeoko per tail. At home, I ran through these pre-rough pieces with a cut-down version of my Setup 1 toolpads, and then it was time for the flip. Based on what I'd learned from my first attempt, I knew that supporting my stock could not be an afterthought. So taking advantage of my threaded table, I installed some bolts I could lock against a nut at a fixed height as a poor man's machinist jack. I began my three kicktails with identical toolpaths. After facing them off, I drove screws through the indexing holes for lack of a better clamping option. Two of the tails I ran my standard Mark II toolpads on, but for the third, because of how one of my decks was screwed up and had a different bevel angle on the bottom, I had to match that angle on the tail, so this one had a different set of G-code to run on it. When it came time to do setups 3 and 4, I was pressed for time. I wanted to get these out to anodizing at least two weeks before Maker Fair, so I had to run these operations at work. I don't have access to a working Shapeoko at Carbide3D, so instead I had to finish up these kicktails on the Nomad. Using indexing pins inserted around the perimeter of my part, I located each kicktail and finished up both the top and bottom faces. Using pins like this is a lot quicker than having to machine a deep pocket to receive each tail. It only takes a minute or two to bore a hole versus half an hour of pocketing MDF or some other low-cost high-volume fixture material. I also had to tweak my original toolpaths which had called for quarter-inch tooling. The Nomad is happiest with eighth-inch end mills or smaller. The Nomad ran through these parts in short order and I had all my longboard parts ready to send to anodizing by lunchtime. I'll admit, the machining of these kicktails was not something I was looking forward to. Every time you move a part or change a setup, you lose a tiny bit of accuracy. You have to be very meticulous about how you proceed from one operation to the next in order to minimize errors. But I was also quite proud of the process I developed to scale up production of these pieces, setup 2 in particular. That DIY machinist jack hack worked out really well. In the next episode, we'll start tying up loose ends and putting this board together. That's a reveal I'm ridiculously excited for. Until then, thanks for watching, good luck, and have fun machining, folks.